Coming up on this week's show, Alex Mishka is here to talk about her more romance series as part of the 2017 GRL blog tour. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knauss. Welcome to episode 97 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And I'm Will from willknauss.com. This week's episode is brought to you in part by listeners just like you. We'll have a little bit more information on how you can help support this show in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Hello. Another week of podcasty goodness. Indeed. And I remembered who I was this week. Yay! (laughs) That's that's always a good start. As opposed to the meltdown of last week. So, tell us. (laughs) Tell us, oh, remembering one, what have you been up to this week? Uh, Pretty much same old, same old. Day job was still crazy town this week, although it kind of eased up towards the end. And I have officially started training my dragon. Train it, train it good. Yes, hopefully. Um, so I've talked the last couple of weeks about moving into some dictation for my writing, and I got my cheap yet more than meets the specs of the dragon software uh, laptop from Dell. I'm still mortified that I brought a PC back into my life. Boo. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so not a fan. Just setting it up reminded me why I was not a fan of the PC. Uh, but so far it seems worthwhile. I spent a few, a few sessions just reading recent works of mine to it. A chapter from the first Winger book, a chapter from somewhere on Mackinac, so that it could hear and start to learn how I talk into our lovely podcast microphone. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I correct it very deliberately as I go to make sure that it understands how I speak and the weird way that I occasionally say things, how it translates into the software. Even just out of the box, it was just incrementally better than what I was getting with Apple Dictate. You mean... Not incremental. You mean vastly superior? I'll take that, too. I think I meant incremental, but vastly superior also works. No, I think (laughs) incremental means tiny steps. This is far, Um, far beyond. My husband is smart. (laughs) But he's right. It's vastly improved. Let me just tell everyone what you mean to say. please do. (laughs) So I've been very pleased with getting it trained and how Mm -hmm. fast it does pick things up. Yeah, uh, and I yesterday was the first day that I uh, dictated new words, mm-hmm. and was so pleased. Like a twenty minute sprint for me when I type, on average, sits between six hundred and six hundred and fifty words. Yesterday, in twenty minutes, I was getting like eight hundred and fifty words, and hopefully, I can get you know even beyond that. In a 20 minute session. Yeah. But if that's 20 minutes, you know, by the time I'm to an hour, I've got, you know, like 2,400 words. Exactly. 2,500 words. So, liking how this is going so far, and it's really easy moving it. I dictate into PC Notepad uh, because the Scott Baker book I've read on dictation talks about if you, there's no reason to dictate like into Word or straight into Scrivener. Because Dragon takes a lot of processing power to run in the first place. So since I'm just first drafting, throw it in the notepad, which takes up no processing capacity, really, to let Dragon do its best work. And then I just drop that to Dropbox, pick it up in Dropbox, throw it to Scrivener, boom. First draft material. So, so far, so good. I'll, I'll keep people posted on how the Dragon thing proceeds in the coming weeks. Cool. Yeah. Lovely, lovely to hear. Um, I will eventually undertake... Or partake, or... Uh, You'll be training your own dragon. Uh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to it, because I know it's hard work. But I also know that it's worthwhile. It really isn't. I fell in much easier than I thought I would. Because for ideal transcription, you you call out your open quote, close quote, period, comma, so that they work into the manuscript correctly. And I know that's kind of where you're a little daunted, I think, in trying to get that in there. Mm-hmm. But I have found that the thing that I miss the most, not unsurprisingly, is remembering where to put my commas. <laughs> because I hate commas anyway. 
but you really fall into it to the point yesterday where I was considering if I ever do a reading somewhere again, <laughs> am I going to be reading the manuscript and calling out periods and close quotes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably not, but that's just my brain kind of went over there for a minute. Anyway. Well, cool. Good. Yeah. Okay. We would like to take a few moments to thank our lovely, loyal patrons who have joined us on Patreon. You're now, awesome. Yes, most definitely. You can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. And for little as 25 cents an episode, your pledge helps pay for the costs of producing and distributing this podcast. And for fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests. Mm -hmm. Now, all patrons have the option to have a personalized thank you sent to them as well. Personalized from me and you. Yep. It is. We write on it and sign our names and everything. <laughs> Also, it's worth mentioning, any month we have pledges that cover our monthly production costs, we'll produce a special bonus episode, especially for our patrons, and we'll be recording the August bonus episode next week. Yes. And, and we should just thank them from the bottom of our hearts, because since we started the Patreon in January, every month we have been making our mm -hmm. production costs, and we can't thank you guys enough for that. Exactly. Now, you can get all the details at our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash big gay fiction podcast once again that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash big gay fiction podcast indeed so i had the pleasure this past week to talk to bethany from rainbow gold reviews uh one of the many fine review sites that's out there mm -hmm. uh covering lgbtq fiction uh they are having a special uh week actually they're having a special couple of weeks that start this very Monday, uh, they're doing the RGR Trans Aware event. And I wanted to get Bethany on to tell us uh, directly from the source why this event was happening. I'm excited to welcome Bethany from Rainbow Gold Reviews to the podcast. Thanks for being here, Bethany. Thank you for having me. Now, we wanted to have you on because this week and next, Rainbow Gold is going to be running RGR's Trans Aware event. And I'd love for you to tell us what that means and what we can expect to see for these uh, two weeks. Well, when we heard about the transgender ban on the military, I don't think any of us were quite surprised, to say the least, knowing who the VP is. So we wanted to do something that focused on the T in the LGBT community. We have done the L. We've done the G, and we've done the B a lot on our blog. So we wanted to do something that focused that week on the T. We reached out. We contacted authors on Facebook and Nine Star Press and asked, hey, you want to spotlight your book? Come on, RGR, and let us tell people what your book's about. If you're a trans author or you write trans characters, we wanted to get your voice out there. We started off with the week and had such a huge response from authors who wanted to help, who wanted their book out there, who just wanted to help in any way, whether it be a giveaway, that we've turned it into a two-week event starting this Monday. That's amazing. How many books do you think you're going to be reviewing? Do you have an idea of a count? Um, we have... Four reviewers who I know have at least two books that they're going to be doing. Um, I would say anywhere from eight to 12 books will be reviewed, as well as a few interviews. I've got a few spotlights set up and um, what we call guest posts, where authors send us why they write in the transgender or why they're writing a trans character or their experience as being trans. We wanted to get that word out, their word, so they could be heard. Mm -hmm. Can you name drop a little bit for us on who we get to see stuff from? Um, I have Zia Laura, who I'm hoping will start off our week, and she's fantastic. I have read Illusions and Dreams by her, and her that is a trans character, and two trans characters in that one, and I love her stuff. So she will start off the week, I'm hoping. I'm hoping to get a few interviews by Jay Northcote, and love his stuff. Um, got a other few authors who are trans, some who just write trans uh, characters. And I think you're going to enjoy seeing all of them every day. 
maybe some new ones, maybe some ones that you, you know you're you're used to or, or read all the time. I think it's going to be a really good turnout for this event. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned there's giveaways too. Will we be seeing giveaways every day at least, or I don't. More I don't that, have or? a lot for every day. We do have a few authors who are giving away more than just one ebook, and um, I have a few things that I have crocheted that I plan on putting in the giveaways. Um, we'll see if we can get a few more in there, and um, I know that there will be a few Amazon giveaways as well. So not every day, but we do have quite a few. That's awesome. What do you hope people come away with as they're reading this material and hopefully picking up some of these books as well? I think what I want them to get from it is basically what I'm getting from it, reading these these guest posts that I'm putting together. That it's, it's not just one type of transgender person. It's, it's, there's different types. There's different Transi- transitioning and there's different types of phrases that people use and it's not just one type of person just like the whole LGBT community it's it's a, such a wide variety that I hope they walk away with a newfound understanding of this letter of our group mm-hmm. that's very well put I certainly hope that that people do you know come away with either a new understanding or perhaps an expanded understanding. Um, exactly. Because if, if you're really presenting that spectrum as the week goes on, there, as you said, there's so much there that just knowing one trans person story isn't getting all of the spectrum in there. Exactly. Exactly. Because there's, there's authors who are trans who write it from their perspective. And then especially the authors who are not trans but who have done – and so much amount of research as to try to make their trans character as authentic as they can make them, mm-hmm. not being a transgendered author. Mm-hmm. Well, that it's really exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing what's coming over the next two weeks. So we'll certainly be encouraging everyone uh, who's listening to go check things out. They can go to rainbowgoldreview.wordpress.com. Yes. And see everything as it happens each day. Is there going to be, I assume it'll be on the homepage every day for people who are looking for it. Yes. The author that we spotlight, interview, or guest post that particular day will be what we call our sticky post, which is going to be the number one post that you see when you uh, log on to our page. Oh, excellent. That'll make it That'll make it easy for people all week long. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be the, the one that's right there in the front. You will see who we're spotlighting, who is the... Author of the day. Perfect. Well, Bethany, thank you so much for for coming on for a few minutes and letting our audience know about this uh, tremendous event you're getting ready to have. Thank you so much, Jeff, for having us. Want to be among the first to know what's coming up on the Big Gay Fiction Podcast? Join the Big Gay Fiction Podcast monthly newsletter. As a subscriber, you'll get our exclusive coloring pages that you can download and color. You can even send us your artistic creations and we'll display them in our online gallery. Go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com and sign up on the homepage. So we both have books this week. It's pretty amazing. I did a trip to San Francisco uh, Monday, Tuesday this past week. So I got to finish a book, start a book, and then finish a book all this week, all on audio. And we're going to kick it off with Romancing the Ugly Duckling by Claire London. Mm -hmm. Now, Romancing the Ugly Duckling is the next book in Claire's Romancing the... series. Um, This particular book is about a lovely young guy named Perry. And Perry works for a London PR firm. And his PR firm has landed a big account. They're trying to pitch... A reality show for a bunch of brothers, uh, the Venturas. They're sort of the male version of the Kardashians. <laughs> anyway, the Venturas, Indeed. the Venturas have a ugly duckling brother who has run away uh, and s- to spend his life in Scotland. So it's Perry is given the task of fetching this runaway brother, giving him a makeover so he's presentable 
for shooting the pilot of this proposed reality television show. So Perry takes off to Scotland uh, <laughs> to the essentially the middle of nowhere uh, <laughs> to search for Greg Ventura. And when he finds Greg, uh, he realizes that he isn't quite the ugly duckling that he was billed as. Uh, he's a perfectly lovely looking guy. Unfortunately, when uh, compared to his better looking, more socially, um, what's the word, more socially su successful brothers, uh, he's sort of the runt of the litter. Um, his brothers are like famous models and football stars. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous. Anyway, so Greg enjoys living out in the middle of nowhere with his dog in his little cottage. Little Rory. Oh, it was so cute. <laughs> Cutest dog ever. And uh, he paints. Uh, he goes diving in the locks for, you know, scallops. And he he manages to eke himself out a respectable living. And this is something Perry comes to realize uh, after spending a few days with uh, Greg in the cottage is that um, life in the middle of nowhere isn't exactly bad. Yeah. <laughs> he ends up getting to know Greg a lot better. Uh, he's not the brutish grumpy bear that he at first <laughs> seems. Uh, he also spends some time getting to know the people of the local village. Uh, kudos to Claire London. Um, she paints uh, a, a lovely canvas of really interesting secondary characters. Mm -hmm. I especially enjoyed Bridie. She's the sister of uh, Greg's best friend in the village. Uh, she's wonderfully funny. I adored her to pieces. And plus, I really thought Claire brought this small town village to life in a mm -hmm. really uh, interesting, uh, detailed way. Um, because uh, pfft, I don't know anything about Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> so I have to assume everything Claire wrote about was, you know, true and accurate. It certainly seemed like it. Anyway, so <laughs> Perry begins falling for Greg, uh, and Greg does so likewise. Um, but eventually, reality, you know, comes back in. It is Perry's job, after all, to bring Greg back to London. Uh, uh, something Greg, you know, wholeheartedly resists. Uh, he went to Scotland for a reason. So, that's the challenges they have to face and overcome. Uh, there's also a terrible storm uh, uh, and uh, wonderful reconciliation in the offices of P the PR company that Perry works for. So what did you think of this fantastic book? <laughs> That's what I thought. It was fantastic. But It was. Think? I think this might be my favorite of the Dream Spuns mm -hmm. so far. The, the characters that Claire built and the scenarios she put them in were just so dead on perfect. Perry and Greg, from the moment they first laid eyes on each other, had this, I love you, I hate you. And it wasn't just, I love you and hate you as a person. It's like, I love and hate everything you're, you're involved in. Exactly. <laughs> For yeah. a while. Right, yeah. Um, because Perry can't early on reconcile being on the island and this very strange place that's very not London. And Greg wants nothing to do with the life that Perry represents to him, um, or with his brothers, for that matter. Um, the storm caused me major stress, Claire. <laughs> um, so shame on you for doing that to me. <laughs> um, but it was also, to me, a major turning point in the story for both characters, uh, that storm, the, and the way that the the book played out after that was pretty much pitch perfect to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I loved everything about it. We have to say too that we we both did this book on audio, and Joel Leslie's narration just sells it all the more. Mm -hmm. um, all the accents he gets to do, uh, I suspect he probably had a lot of fun with this book. And he just, he, he nails every aspect of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I think we both give it a big thumbs up. Oh, yeah. Romancing the Ugly Dunkling by Claire London. And audio by Joel Leslie. Highly recommend that. If you haven't, if you haven't 
um, dove into audio yet, uh, maybe consider making this one your first. Uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Yeah, I think that's a good point because it's not it's not a heavy book. Mm-hmm. It's not a long book. Um, and Joel just, like we said, really nails it. Okay. You also read something else, something like Autumn. Indeed, yes. Uh, no big surprise I keep going through the Something Like books. Uh, something Like Autumn is book four in J. Bell's series uh, that kicks off with Something Like Summer. This one is takes a divergent path from the first three because the book opens and its main character is someone we have not met before. So that's different. Uh, Jason is a orphan who is 16, who is going into his 20-something-ish uh, foster family. Uh, he typically, in short order, finds something not to like with his foster families and does something to get him sent back to the group home. Uh, in this case, his foster brothers that are already there, uh, he takes on he takes quite a liking to uh, the, the youngest of them, who I believe is about seven or eight years old. She's just adorable. Um... The two middle children are okay. Uh, one's a little too video game obsessed. But the biological son in this family, uh, whose name is Caesar, uh, really catches his eye. And eventually they kind of form... They, they're on their way to being boyfriends when they're discovered. And that discovery bounces Jason back to the group home. And so he kind of ends up looking to what he's going to do in his life. Because he's really not sure at 16 if he can just wait till he's 18 or what he wants to do. The connection to the former books in this at the moment is Michelle, who is his caseworker, who is Chase's uh, sister from something like Summer. And so she kind of guides him a little bit. There's an awesome uh, moment where Jason gets a visit from Jace, which is very cool. Um, Life kind of happens, and uh, not unsurprisingly... Jason ends up in Austin and is taken in, uh, as he's turning 19, I believe, uh, taken in by Ben and Tim. So this book gets to not only follow Jason and his journey, like all these books always do. You start with somebody who's in high school and you get them into their adulthood. So there's years that pass for Jason and it, I, I, his his pre getting to Austin was nice, but really getting to Austin and watching him kind of bloom under the mentorship of of Ben and Tim was awesome. But you also get this major extension of the story of Ben and Tim from Jason's point of view, which was it just warmed my heart and I laughed and I cried and you know once again J Bell makes me cry in cars <laughs> while I'm driving. It always works out that way. That no matter what happens, I ultimately listen to the saddest parts of the book while I'm in a car. Mm-hmm. So, Something Like Autumn by J. Bell. Audio is always by Kevin R. Free, who just brings tremendous life to these characters. So, loved it to pieces. Cool. Yeah. Also this week, we managed to uh, watch a few movies uh, we thought some of you might be interested in. First, let's tackle the thriller we watched earlier this week. Mm-hmm. Kiss Me, Kill Me. Now, this is sort of a postmodern, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It is uh, noir, a postmodern Hollywood noir with uh, little teeny tiny touches of Hitchcock. Uh, it basically stars uh, a ton of really familiar faces. Uh, you might recognize Van Hansis, Gail Harold is also in this, uh, J. Uh, J. Rodriguez, Kit Williamson, Brianna Brown, both of those, them are from Eastsiders as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the story mainly concerns uh, Van's character. Uh, he ha- He's living in the Hollywood Hills with his rich, successful, soon-to-be husband, uh, and they're celebrating his birthday. Um, they manage to have a fight, uh, and unfortunately, not too soon after that, um, Van's husband is gunned down in a robbery at a convenience store. Now, uh, circumstances being what they are, Van doesn't remember the exact details of what happened that night, and he is actor, uh, he's actually under suspicion Mm -hmm. for the murder of his fiancée. And, of course, there are lots of secondary characters and red herrings and people with agendas. 
um, really interesting, fun stuff. What did you think? Yeah, I had a great time with it. I liked the Hitchcock and the Noor elements of it. Uh, I thought Van was tremendous in a role that's different from things that we've seen him in before. Mm-hmm. Uh, the supporting cast was great. Uh, I couldn't help but snicker a little bit every time Kit and Van would walk off together, because that's very East Siders. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I have to say, too, I mean, it's tangential to the film, almost, but the I really liked the film score, too, because it just gave that noir element to it but it was a fun 90 minutes and i have to say i didn't figure it out until it was until it was over and i'm like what whoa (laughs) there are some pretty cuckoo twists towards the very very end um which makes the movie kind of uh uh it takes it a, a little over the top um so i don't think it's uh a classically serious film noir uh, no. Um, <laughs> I think it's a teensy bit ton- tongue-in-cheek, uh, but it's still a whole lot of fun. Uh, we both highly recommend that. Yeah. Okay, also, we watched a documentary uh, called Dancer, uh, and it's essentially about the life of uh, Russian ballet dancer um, Sergei Pulnin. Uh, now, you may not recognize Sergei's name, but in 2015, there was a viral video of a a solo dancer and his routine choreographed to uh, Hoser's Take Me to Church. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you probably all know exactly what video I'm talking about. That video, incidentally, was sort of meant as Sergei's swan song. Uh, He was, at that point in his life, ready to say goodbye to ballet. And Dancer, the documentary, traces his very humble origins in the Ukraine to his meteoric rise in the world of ballet, uh, becoming the youngest principal dancer ever at the Royal Ballet in London, Mm -hmm. and uh, his subsequent bad boy status. Uh, What did you think of this one? This made me sad. It made you sad? It did. Oh. Uh, Because you don't often, at least I don't, I don't know how everybody else feels about it, you don't often think of these... um, ballet dancers and artists who who perform at a really high level getting to the point where they really don't like what they do anymore. We're always made to believe, at least, that you know the ballet dancers are living out their dream because they're getting to perform at the Royal Ballet Company or with American Ballet Theater or whatever. And here's somebody who, from the tiniest of ages, was put into ballet, and he was really good at it. You don't become the youngest principle by 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 accident he was really good and at some point he felt he was pushed too far and his body hurt all the time and he was ready to stop and and that just it made me sad a little bit and that he could get to that point where he no longer enjoys this what most people would consider to be a great creative endeavor Mm -hmm. um i was glad that it seemed like towards the end and after take me to church that he felt like he was in a better place mm-hmm. um, artistically and personally and physically um, and everything. I really enjoyed the film. I did not know his story. I actually had never seen Take Me to Church. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a great piece to check out. I think what the, I think what the main point of the documentary is not only, you know, exploring Sergei's story, but I think it's, examining the idea that if if you just happen to be good at something does that therefore mean that you are somehow um required mm. to do that one thing uh yeah because, that's a good perspective be, also because it's you know viewed as a gift or something special that other people don't have um and I think that was something that he was wrestling with. Yes. Because uh, he happened to be very good <laughs> at dancing. Uh, but after a while, he uh, lost uh, that passion and that drive for it. And, and to be clear, that's what made me sad is that he lost that passion. Not that he made the choices he did because he, he needed to make those for his, his sanity and his well-being. Exactly. But losing the passion was sad. Mm-hmm. 
So highly recommend checking out Dancer if you have the opportunity. Now, you've watched a couple more things that I had no part of. Mm -hmm. So please tell us. No part at all. Um, <laughs> well, one of them I didn't want a part of. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and for some reason, Jeff was scared to watch Get Out. Um, Get Out uh, opened in theaters earlier this year and kind of uh, took the world by storm. It's a smaller, uh, smaller uh, thriller that no one quite expected to break out the way that it did. Incidentally, I was just looking at some things online, and I happened to run across this story that Get Out is the most successful movie of 2017. Oh, wow. Now, uh, that comes with the caveat is, is that it hasn't made the most money sure. in 2017. So far, Beauty and the Beast has... Um, earned a g g gazillion dollars <laughs> um but where beauty and the beast has uh i think i think i was looking at the numbers it has a 300 percent return on its investment get out has an over 600 percent return Ooh. on its initial uh production cost good job guys because it was a much smaller movie and it cost far less to make um its success has really catapulted it uh uh into i mean i don't think anyone involved knew how uh successful uh this movie could be anyway let me talk about what the movie is about <laughs> um uh essentially uh it's not a horror movie like jeff thought that's how it was marketed he, he's a bit of a wimp what it's really is it's a thriller in the vein of the stepford wives uh which had me interested in it uh, it's about uh, an interracial couple who go to, I believe, uh, to her white family's home in Virginia. She's taking him uh, to her, uh, to where she grew up to, you know, meet the family. Uh, and um, dark, mysterious things begin to happen. Um, and it's sort of a postmodern twist on the Stepford Wives idea. Uh, and the the whole movie really sort of plays with that in a really interesting way. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend you check it out. There's some uh, super, uh, amazing performances. I think that's what helps. The material is really, really um, interesting. Um, and I think the performances uh, by the entire cast, uh, Bradley Whitford and Catherine Keener play the uh, creepy parents who <laughs> all is not what it seems <laughs> so uh i highly recommend get out if you have the chance to see it it's really really good all right maybe i'll watch it some other time okay also this week i watched another documentary it's called doomed the untold story of um uh fantastic four roger corman robert roger corman's fantastic four so in the early 90s uh roger corman teamed up with uh, another a producing partner, uh, and they made the very first Fantastic Four movie. Um, if you're a hardcore nerd, you probably know about this film. Uh, bootlegs of this movie have been, you know, circulating at, at cons and online for a long, long time. Uh, the Fantastic Four has the dubious honor of being the only movie Roger Corman has made but never released. Mm. Out of his very long uh, kind of wackadoodle career <laughs> of producing low-budget fare, this is the only movie that hasn't officially seen the light of day. And Doomed kind of goes into the backstory of why that is so. Um, primarily, it also covers the, the making of the movie. Uh, and why it was rushed into production and made so quickly and so cheaply, and why it has not seen the light of day. Um, what what Doomed really illustrates is how everyone involved with making the movie was incredibly passionate about it. They really genuinely believed in, t in it. Everyone who made it believed in it back then, uh, and they still believe in it now because they've all showed up and they all do on-camera interviews for this documentary. Wow. Um, so I, if, if you're interested in this sort of weird little footnote 
in comic book movie history, uh, I highly recommend checking out Doomed. Cool. Now, all of these movies that we've just spoken about are available for rent or purchase or streaming at all the usual spots, Netflix or Amazon or wherever. Yeah, we'll put some links in the show notes so people can find them, for sure. So, I had the pleasure this week of talking to author Alex Mishka. Oh, cool. New to me author. She writes the More Romance series and has a couple other books out besides that. She's headed to her first GRL in Denver. Yay! And uh, we talked to her about that and about her books. Today I'm welcoming Alex Mishka to the podcast as part of the 2017 GRL blog tour. Alex is a certifiable math geek who spends her days dreaming of quirky, sexily intelligent men falling in love. She's a former math teacher to students with learning disabilities and is a disability advocate. Nestled in a small house in the woods, Alex is the doting parent of a happy, fluffy white dog and his somewhat gloomy older brother, as well as the servant to two highly opinionated Siamese cats. Welcome, Alex. Hi, nice to meet you. Good to meet you, too. You're a new-to-me author. So let's start off and have you tell me what kind of stories you write. Okay, well, they're happy, quirky books intended to make people smile. Um, Geeks falling in love. Uh, Their pets are a big part of the family. And I try to touch on some serious issues, but in the end, it's just intended to make people smile and have the warm fuzzies and escape. So tell us about your series that you've got going. The More Romance series has um, two more brothers. The third is straight, but um, and one of their friends um, all fall in love with uh, math geeks. And their pets, as you get further on in the series, have more and more, a larger and larger role. But um, the final book is coming out at end of August, beginning of September. It's almost done. So if folks come to GRL will be able to pick that up from you. Oh, yes, definitely. And uh, Chance for More, the first book, will be coming out on audiobook soon. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I'm very excited. So in your mind, what are the ingredients that make a romance so enjoyable and popular? Um, it's really the characters. It's, I, I mean, the plots are just kind of window dressing, but people read it for the characters. They want to live with them and fall in love. And it's kind of hard if you don't like the people involved. So, And the more you get to know the characters, the fuller they are, the more you get um, drawn into it and a part of it. So it's really just the characters more than the plot or anything else. So along that line, you mentioned you know, plot as window dressing almost. Yeah. So do you think peop- that, that readers actually love tropes or, you know, is it the characters that make the tropey book stand out from the crowd more than anything else? Um, it's both. Um, everyone says we want something different and exciting, and it is always cool to find one. But usually when you have time to sit down with a book, what you need is literary comfort food. I mean, even foodies sometimes want macaroni and cheese or their mom's pot roast. So um, you pick up these books to satisfy your craving, and that's why tropes are there. So that you're like, oh, yeah, I want to read about a fireman. Or I want to see a fake marriage. And, you know, the thing is, if you order a burger and fries and instead you get, like, steak and mashed potatoes, like, yeah, that's great. And there, it seems like an upgrade, but it's not really what I ordered. So... The tropes, you have to hit the parts that make it enjoyable, make, that are that make the trope what they are. Like if you have a billionaire, if he's just hanging out with another billionaire, the money doesn't really matter as much. Um, an mpreg doesn't matter unless they worry about things like babies and pregnancy. And, you know, having a baby or pregnancy is also a big deal. Um, a fake relationship, they actually have to have a moment where they fake intimacy. And, but... Other than that, I mean, books are combinations of tropes. There are two characters getting put into it. There's external conflict, internal conflict, plot, and then the world they're in. I mean, it's different if you're in a small town in the Midwest or if you're in New York City or if you're in Scotland. They're all 
Or, you know, if it's a paranormal world with alphas and omegas or shifters or vampires. Um, these are all tropes that make it deeper. But really what matters is the characters and what their motivations are and their reactions. That's what makes it stand out. And that's what we're really looking for. So you like the situation and then you want to see what happens. Because mm -hmm. otherwise they'd all be identical. Do you have favorite tropes, either as a reader or a writer? Um, that changes. Um, some Most of my favorite tropes are, if there's a fake relationship, it has to be for a good reason. Um, I like when there are pets, but there don't have to be. Um, but usually adults and intelligent adults are my big two favorite things. Um, May, December, I like it, but I'm a teacher, so... Seeing a uh, teacher getting with a student, it squidges me out for some reason. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I'm pretty, I'll read just about anything. But I like happy books. Now, you've mentioned before we started recording that you mm -hmm. talk to your characters and you really let them take over. Now, now, what does that mean exactly? Well, I start out with, sometimes I start out with characters and sometimes I start out with a plot. Um, but that's all I start out with, and I get a really weird about it and try to get to know the characters. So I, I figure out what's that one thing that really embarrassed them in middle school that they'll still, like, remember at 3 o'clock in the morning and be unable to sleep? Or what's their favorite food? Or, you know, just weird random stuff that never gets into the book. And then... I have like the general outline of everything I want to have. I can even have like long descriptions of what will happen in each scene. But in the end, it's really wouldn't instilt it unless I let the characters be themselves. And then they start to take off and it gets a little crazy. And then I have to re-outline everything because they said, I love you too early. I'm like, <laughs> it's like 40% of the way through the book. Why are you doing this? Because it just felt right fine so that's often what happens and sometimes it just means awkward love scenes <laughs> because nobody's completely suave in the bedroom and so there's a lot more talking leading up to it than i planned <laughs> <laughs> so what are you looking forward to at grl this year is this your first one yes this is my first one and i am so excited um being a reader and even when I first started writing, it was very solitary. I didn't know that there was Facebook. like, th And there's this huge community on Facebook of people just interacting and talking about things. And it's been so much fun. And um, so I felt very in my own little bubble until I started to branch out. Once I started publishing, I started talking to people. And I'm just so excited to meet all the people from that culture. The readers, the writers, everyone I've met so far has been really fun and sweet and smart. And I'm really excited to be silly with them. Very cool. And it will be a very silly weekend for sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, you've got a giveaway for our listeners. What are you offering up? Um, well, I've decided to give three e-copies of my first book. And if nobody, if that one of those people already has that book, I'll give them a copy of one of another one from my backlist. And if they have all of those, um, I'll give them a copy of the final book in the series, which is coming out in a few weeks. And they'll get it as soon as it goes live on Amazon. Very cool. Well, people will find a raffle copter in the show notes for this week's episode. And uh, we will find three readers for you. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. What's the best way for everyone to keep up with you on social media? Um, I have an author page that people can like, and that'll just give you the basic updates. But if you want to interact and chat and that sort of thing, like me on, I mean, friend me on Facebook. And because I have a page I use personally, and that's a lot of fun too. And you can always keep up with me on that. Great. We'll link up to that, plus your website, and uh, make all that available in our show notes as well. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. Well, Alex, it's been great talking to you. We look forward to meeting you in Denver. 
It was great talking to you, too. I'm really excited to meet you there, too. The Big Gay Fiction Podcast is thrilled to once again partner with Gay Romlet as a featured blogger. You can see all the participating blogs and the full GRL blog tour schedule at gayromlet.com slash 2017 blog tour. Gay Romlet is an annual retreat that brings together the people who create and celebrate LGBT romance for a one-of-a-kind must-attend gathering of dynamic, informal, and diverse fun. Each year, the retreat travels to a new city and hosts tons of events from raucous parties to mellow tete-a-tetes while still maintaining a spirit of familiarity. GRL is the place to connect with old friends, find family you didn't know you had, and meet with both newly published and established authors in the gay romance genre. This year's retreat is set for October 19 through 22 in Denver, Colorado at the Denver Marriott Tech Center. For more information or to register, please visit GayRomlet.com. The new adult hockey romance, Rivals, by Jeff Adams, is now available in audiobook as performed by Derek McLean. Mitchell Turner and Alex Goodman squared off on the ice throughout high school. Their rivalry was tough on Mitchell because he harbored a huge crush on Alex. With high school and college behind them, they meet unexpectedly on Thanksgiving Day, once again on the ice. Mitchell is thrilled to see his one-time adversary all grown up. With their rivalry in the past, could this be the start of something magical for the holidays and beyond? Written by Jeff Adams and performed by Derek McLean, Rivals is available at Amazon.com, Audible, and iTunes. Also available in ebook. Get your copy today. Thank you once again to Alex for stopping by and talking to us for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to meeting you, Alex, in Denver. Um, for everyone who is uh, headed to Denver in October, um, keep an eye on the author lists at grl.com or gayromlet.com. Gay that's, yes, gayromlet.com. Yeah, that's the, the official website address. Um, there have been some authors who have had to drop out for various reasons. I think we've kind of come up on the time of year, sort of like uh, at the end of summer, mm -hmm. where people have to kind of reassess, you know, their family commitments or maybe their finances or or what have you um a couple of authors have had to drop out uh and some new authors have come in to take their place so um if you are attending grl in october i highly recommend going to the website and seeing who the sponsoring authors are and the the supporting the, and the featured yes the supporting yeah. and the featured uh and seeing who you can check out while you're there also a lot of the uh, attending authors are doing book pre-orders. Mm -hmm. um, now, they're doing this uh, for several reasons, really. The main one is is that uh, selling products uh, in another state from where you're, well, well, from a state where you're not from, it, yeah, there, there, there are complicated, you know, taxes and laws, and sometimes it can get a little bit complicated as you found out in the past. Yes. So to keep things simpler, um, there are several authors who are doing GRL pre-orders, which means you can order your books from them. They will then take the books uh, with them to Denver, where you can pick them up and get them signed. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I highly recommend you check out uh, your most favoritist authors <laughs> on social media. Most of them have been uh, making posts about their pre-orders uh, and when you should have your orders in b b before the deadline, before we all head on out to Denver. Indeed, yes. I need to actually get my own pre-orders up soon. <laughs> That's on my to-do list. Exactly. So I can exactly. do that. So I think that'll wrap us up for this week. Uh, what do we got coming up next week? Coming up in episode 98, Casey Wells will be here to talk about her books, including her latest Dream Spun Desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. So everyone, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter if you have a book. Until next time, guys, keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. 